Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is managing File Vault 2 with FDE setup on OS 10 Mountain Line. If you do not want to be in this session, that was your you know cue to exit quietly in the back. Uh, my name is uh, Rich Troughton. I am the lead help desk technician at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And before we get started, there's two things I'd like to mention. The first is that all the slides, the speaker's notes, and the demos are available for download, and I'm going to be providing a link at the end of the talk. I tend to be one of those folks that can't keep up with the speaker and take notes at the same time. So for those folks in the same boat, no need to take notes. Everything that you're about to see is going to be available for download after the talk. The second is to please hold all questions until afterwards. If you've got questions, you know, make a note of them and hit me with them afterwards during Q&A. With luck, I'll be able to answer most of your questions during the talk itself. So, to better understand the capabilities of FDE setup and how File Vault management works on 10.8, let's take a look underneath File Vault 2's hood to see how it handles authentication, unlocking, and decryption. To begin with, passwords are almost irrelevant to File Vault 2's encryption. Instead, the system relies on a series of cryptographic keys granting access to two other layers of keys. These keys are the derived encryption key, the key encryption key, and the volume encryption key. Now, to give everyone an idea of how the keys are interacting with each other, here's a visual representation of what's happening when you log in at the preview login screen. So to take them from the bottom layer up, let's first look at the volume encryption key. This is the key that's interacting with the core storage volume that the File Vault 2 encryption process has created. All cryptographic operations on an encrypted core storage volume are unique to that volume because a different volume encryption key is randomly generated for each volume. This is the key that's actually unlocking your encrypted volume, and it's also the key that's deleted when a wipe command is sent to a File Vault 2 encrypted machine. Now, on the next level up, there's the key encryption key. This key is generated when File Vault 2 encryption is initialized on a particular volume. It's used to unlock the volume encryption key that's one layer down and acts as the middleman between the volume encryption key and the derived keys. This middle layer allows the derived keys to change without affecting the derived key's ability to unlock the encrypted volume. And on the top layer, there's the derived encryption keys. These keys begin the chain reaction of unlocking the other keys below it, resulting in the unlocking or the decryption of the encrypted volume. Any derived key can be independently changed without affecting its ability to unlock the other two layers of keys. Now, any given core storage volume must support multiple cryptographic users, each with their own derived key. Now, this is important because it means that there can be multiple ways to access the encrypted volume. In the case of File Vault 2's encryption, it means that multiple user accounts can be enabled to unlock an encrypted MAC at the preboot login screen. And derived keys are also used for the File Vault 2 recovery keys. So to break it down further, in this illustration, this process opens the door you're seeing above. You enter your password, and the password is converted to a derived key with the RSA password-based key derivation function. This is otherwise known as PBKDF2. The derived key then unlocks the key encryption key, represented here by the vault door. Once the key encryption key has been unlocked, it grants access to the volume encryption key. The volume encryption key, represented here by the lock in the house, then unlocks and the OS boots. Now, the key encryption key is the key that gets updated whenever accounts are added, deleted, or when passwords are changed. With each account change, addition, or removal, the key encryption key gets rewrapped to allow for the updated information. So, how do you get a derived key in the first place? Well, there's a couple of ways. The first is to have your access set up when File Vault 2 encryption is initialized. Since there's no pre-existing keys at this point, your password or other means of access get enabled at the same time that the encryption is initialized. Once the encryption's turned on, though, it's much tougher. The bouncer's standing by the door, and he'll stop you from coming in unless you can show that you're properly legit. So the only way to get in at this point is to have a friend who's on the inside vouch for you. An existing derived key can be used to enable new derived keys. So your friend who's already inside can use his derived key to enable your account. Now, at this point, a new derived key is set up for um, your account to give you access, and you're good to go. Now, without an existing derived key available, though, there's no way to get a new derived key set up. To make a long story extremely short, if you don't have a friend on the inside, well, you're not getting in. So. Before we dive into FDE setup on Mountain Line, let's take a look at what File Vault 2 and 10.7 does not have. You can monitor, unlock, or decrypt a File Vault 2 encrypted boot drive using command line tools, but you can't start the encryption process from the command line using Apple's native tools. 
Instead, the encryption uh, process needs to be started from system preferences file vault preference pane. It's not possible to see who has file vault to enabled accounts without looking at the pre-boot login screen. It can be difficult to enable an account without using the file vault preference pane. It is not possible to remove an account from the list of enabled accounts without either deleting the account or setting the account password to be blank. And you have to choose between using the individual alphanumeric recovery key or using the institutional recovery key using filevaultmaster.keychain. FDE setup on 10.8 allows FileVault administration from the command line, and it solves all those problems with its various functions. It will turn on FileVault to encryption using a variety of options. It'll disable encryption. It'll allow addition and removal of FileVault to enable the users from the command line. It'll supply you a list of the currently authorized users, provide encryption status, and much more. So, FDE setup has a number of verbs associated with it. The ones that may be most commonly used are enable, disable, add, list, remove, and sync. FDE setup is amazingly flexible when it comes to enabling file to encryption from the command line. To start with the simplest method, you would run the command shown on the screen to enable file to encryption. Next, you'll be prompted for the username and password of the primary user, which is the account that you want to have appear at the pre-boot login screen once the encryption is turned on. If everything's working properly, you'll be given an alphanumeric individual recovery key and prompted to restart. Now, one thing that's very important to know is that individual recovery key is not saved anywhere. You need to make a record of it when it shows up or you don't have it later. You can also enable additional user accounts at the time of encryption, as long as the accounts are either local or mobile network users. You'll run the command as shown on the screen, and you'll specify the accounts that you want. And as part of this, you will be prompted for the account's passwords. As after that, you'll be given the individual recovery key and prompted to restart. And all the accounts specified should appear at the file vault 2 preboot login screen. And for those who want to automate the process, FD setup also supports importing a property list file via standard input. The plist file needs to follow the format shown up on the screen, and more users can be added by appending their information under the additional user's plist key. Now, once the plist has been set up, you run the command shown on the screen to enable file vault to encryption and then reference the information that is in that plist file. Now, since the accounts and passwords are in the plist file, FD setup will not prompt you for their passwords. Instead, the individual recovery key is displayed and the user is prompted to restart. And all the accounts specified in the plist file should then appear at the file vault 2 preboot login screen. <coughs> to avoid the need to enter a password, FD setup also has a defer flag. And that can be used with the enable verb to delay enabling file vault 2 until after the user logs out. Now with the defer flag, the user will be prompted for their password at their next logout. And that's important. It's not restart. It's the next time they actually log out. The recovery key information is not generated until the user password is obtained. So the defer option is going to require a file location where this recovery information can be written to as a plist file. So this plist file will be written as a root-only readable file, and it will contain information similar to what's shown up on the screen here. Now, for security reasons, since this does contain the recovery key, this should not stay in your system. You know, basically, it's as uh, after you restart, you should get it and then delete it from the system as soon as possible. If you have a particular user account that you want to enable, you would run the command as shown on the screen to defer enabling File Vault 2 and specify the account that you want. If you don't want to specify the account, you would run the command shown on the screen. If there's no account specified, then the currently logged in user will be chosen and enabled. If there's nobody logged in at the time, then the next user that logs in will be chosen and enabled. On logout, the user will be prompted to enter their account password. And once entered, file vault 2 will uh, be enabled, and the recovery information PLS file will be created. And once the enabling process is complete, the Mac will restart. Now, one really important thing to keep in mind about the defer option is that it will enable one user account at the time of turning on file vault 2 encryption. You can't use it to enable multiple accounts, and you can't use it once file vault 2 encryption is turned on. It is really a one account, one time deal. I've heard from lots of people who wish it was otherwise, but you know. Now, something this is, this is something better shown than explained. Let's take a look at how the defer process works. So we're going to start by Logging in is me, or rather, this is past me, for those people who have uh, sat through my presentations before. All 
All right, and the first place we want to go is into terminal. And the command we're going to run is sudo fd setup enable. We're going to tell it we want it to defer. And then the next thing we need to do is we need to provide the path for our plist. So we're just going to do path to recover.plist and hit return. And the password we're being prompted here is just for sudo. This is not going to be for an account password. All right, so we're all now set up for a deferred enablement. So let's go ahead and exit out of terminal. And let's go ahead and log out. Okay, and since I didn't specify an account, the currently logged in user, which is me, has been chosen, and it's asking me for what's my password. I'm gonna go ahead, it's now doing its thing. Once all the bookkeeping is done, the Mac is gonna restart. <coughs> Fun fact, if you hit that OK button, this, the window disappears, but it doesn't actually change anything. You know, your Mac will still restart, encryption will still be turned on. Okay, here we are at the FileVault 2 preboot login screen. Here's my account. I'm the only one who's enabled, so I'm the only one showing up. Fun fact, as a fail-safe measure, it doesn't, uh, FileVault 2 encryption doesn't actually kick off until I enter my pa until you enter your account password. That's a fail-safe just to make sure something goes wrong. It's not a big deal. Your Mac doesn't actually start encrypting until you have logged in for the first time. All right, there we go. And let's just check on the status of our File Vault 2 encryption. So go into System Preferences, Security and Privacy. And through the magic of the movies, because otherwise y'all would have to go out for a break for a while. Um, ooh, not actual real world speed. Not real world speed. <laughs> so as you can see, recovery key has been set. It's uh, using the individual recovery key, and we're good to go. And let's take a look at that uh, recovery.plus. So let's go ahead and drop into a root shell because after all, this is readable only by root. I'm gonna do cat path to, come on, type a little faster. There we go, recovery.plist. All right, so there's the contents of our plist that's, uh, that got saved when we set up the defer, including that all important recovery key. And there we go. That's how a deferred enablement works. Now, another new capability of uh, FileVault 2 and Mountain Lion is the ability to use the alphanumeric individual recovery key and institutional recovery key using FileVault master.keychain, or both kinds of recovery key at the same time. Now, as seen in the earlier examples, FDE setup will provide the individual recovery key by default. To use the institutional recovery key, the keychain flag needs to be used as shown up on the screen. Now, the individual recovery key is displayed, but the encryption will also use the filevaultmaster.keychain institutional recovery key. In case recovery is needed, either recovery key will be acceptable for doing the recovery. Now, if you want to specify that only the file vault master keychain be used, both the keychain and no recovery key flags need to be used when enabling encryption. Now, I wish Apple had actually named that no recovery key thing a little better, but basically what that means is there's no individual recovery key. It doesn't mean that there's actually no recovery key. As a matter of fact, you can't turn on file vault 2 with no recovery key. It will yell at you. FD setup is also capable of creating a file vault master keychain and automatically storing it in library keychains. To do this, an existing file vault 2 public key needs to be available as a DER encoded certificate file. Now, once that's available, the command shown on the screen will enable file vault 2, automatically create the institutional recovery key with the supplied certificate file, and store it as library keychains, file vault master.keychain. So let's take a look at how you would create that DER encoded certificate file from an existing public key. So in this case, we're going to assume that uh, there's not an existing file vault master.keychain on this machine. So we're actually going to go ahead and create one. And to do that, we're going to use uh, security, create file vault master keychain. Pass me types a little slow sometimes. You've got to be patient. <laughs> and we're going to put it in a library keychains, and we're going to call it filevaultmaster.keychain. All 
All right, first password is for sudo. Then after that, we're going to put in the uh, password that your institution has agreed to use as uh, your master password. Retype that just to make sure it's right. It's generated. All's right with the world. So let's go ahead and uh, exit out. And the next place we want to go is keychain access. And there's our file vault master.keychain. Oh, it's locked. But fortunately, public key doesn't matter if it's locked or not. You can export it out regardless. Because public keys need no protection. So we're going to save it as file format certificate.cer. So file vault.cer. That will save it as a DER encoded certificate file. So there we go. That was it. You know, just have to go into keychain access, do your thing, and it appears out on the desktop ready to go. Now to specify that only the file vault master keychain be used as a recovery key, you would add the no recovery key flag to the command. Now along with the various options for enabling, it's also possible to force a restart of the Mac once file vault 2 has been successfully configured. Now this can help automate the process of enabling file vault 2 on a Mac if no input from a logged in user is needed. For example, an organization may want to pre-configure its Macs to automatically encrypt with file vault 2 at first boot with a local admin account enabled. It also wants to use only the institutional recovery key. Now, if a plist with the desired account information and a certificate file to create uh, the institutional recovery key is available, the command shown on the screen could be run to enable file vault 2 and then force a restart at first boot. So, since this combines three different enable options, let's take a look at how it works uh, when you run that command to automatically encrypt. In this case, I'm going to be enabling three accounts via a plist file and setting the institutional recovery key as the sole recovery key. So let's go ahead and run this, this extremely long command. So we're going to do sudo fde setup enable. We're going to say input plist. We're going to feed it the path to that plist. Next, we're going to feed it the certificate file. And in this case, we're actually going to be using the file vault.cer we just set up a couple seconds ago. So, no recovery key, the badly named no recovery key, and then force restart. Now, be sure you actually want to restart the machine before you uh, hit, uh, before you enter the password here, because it will restart. I mean, there's no stopping it. So, it's setting up our three accounts. <coughs> and boom. There you go. Here's our three accounts. Administrator, Rich Troughton, and Troughton Rich. Because you just can't have enough. Um, that, that last one's actually my AD account. So that, you know, I like to distinguish between them a little. Uh, so, logged in. Encryption's kicking off. All right, and since we force restarted, we of course have this terminal session of Christmas past that we should probably get rid of. So let's go ahead and exit out. <clears throat> exit out, thank you. And let's go check on uh, our status. So we're going into system preferences, security and privacy, Once again, this is not real world speed through movie magic. I'm going to make this go faster. Okay, maybe I can make it go a little faster. There we go. Um, so there we go. It's encrypting. It's finished. And uh, one important thing to know is that with uh, the individual uh, recovery key, it's no matter uh, if it's in the mix, it's going to say a recovery key has been set, period. Even if you're using both the individual and institutional recovery key, if you have it in the mix, it's going to say a recovery key has been, period. The only time you'll see a recovery key has been set by your company, school, or institution is if you are using the institutional recovery key as your sole recovery key. So just a little way that maybe can help you tell what kind of recovery key is set on the machine. Now, in contrast to all the various options available for enabling, uh, file vault 2 using FTE setup. 
the command to turn off file vault 2 encryption is FD setup disabled. That's it. There's no other flags associated with it. It's, it's basically an off switch. Now, once the Mac has been fully encrypted with file vault 2, you can add additional users using FD setup. Now, to do so, you'll need to provide both the username and password of a previously enabled account, as well as the password of the account that you want to add. The command shown on the screen will enable a specified user on this encrypted Mac. The primary user can be any account on the Mac that it was that had been previously enabled for file vault 2. Remember how your friend on the inside could give you a derived key? This is how this works. Now, for those who want to automate the process, FDE setup also supports importing a plist file via standard input, and the plist file needs to follow that format shown up on the screen. When adding additional users using a plist file, the top-level username key is actually ignored, and the password key value should be an existing file vault user's password. And more users can be added as needed by appending their information under the additional user's plist key. Now, the FDE setup man page references the ability to use the recovery key to add additional users. However, this function does not work as a 10A3, unfortunately. Apple is aware of the issue and is planning to fix it in a future OS release. Now, when I talked to them, it sounded more like future OS release meant 10.9. I'm not really, you know, I'm not sanguine about it. Don't take that as uh, Bible truth. But that was the impression that I got when I talked to them. Now, once the plist has been set up, you can run the command shown on the screen to add additional users by referencing the account information in the plist file. Now, to list all accounts enabled for file vault 2, FDE setup includes the list verb. To get a list of all File Vault 2 enabled accounts on a particular machine, you would run the command as shown on the screen. And all enabled accounts will be listed with both their account's username and their UUID. Now, to remove accounts from the list of File Vault 2 accounts, FDE setup includes the remove verb. And you can remove users by using either their username or the account UUID. Now, I am not certain what kind of situation would arise where you would have their UUID, but you would not have their account name but it is nice to know that you do have both options. Now to remi remove the account by username, you would run the command as shown on the screen and provide the account's username. Similarly, to remove it using the UUID, you would run this command and then provide the account's UUID. FDE setup also has the sync verb, which allows File Vault 2 to check with the Mac's directory service. So for example, you're running Active Directory or Open Directory, sync will check with that and it'll see which accounts have been changed. Its main use currently is to automate the disabling of File Vault 2 enabled accounts by checking the directory service to see which accounts have been removed. Now, I want to you know, emphasize removed, because if you just disable it, you know, FD Setup Syncs is going to go, oh, yeah, the account's still there. It's only when it's removed that it'll do the magic. Now, an account has been removed from the directory service. Running FD Setup Sync on an encrypted Mac will automatically remove the account from the list of File Vault 2 enabled accounts. Now, the sync will only affect the, the account's File Vault 2 status. It doesn't mean that you know, the entry for the mobile account is being taken out, and it doesn't mean that the uh, user's home folder has been taken off the machine. It just means their account disappears from the File Vault 2 preboot login screen. Now, one important thing to know is that sync does not allow accounts to be automatically added, only removed. File Vault 2 will make you jump through hoops to add somebody, but it's perfectly happy with taking somebody away. It likes to lock people out. Well, you know what I mean. Not actually lock people out. Um, so, 10.8.2 introduced a new function for FDE setup, and that's auth restart. I think someone had a question about how do I get it back to the login screen? This is for you. So, FDE setup auth restart will allow a one time restart of a File Vault 2 encrypted Mac, which goes to the regular login window instead of the File Vault 2 preview login screen. Now, as this is something that's best shown, here's what happens when FDE setup auth restart is executed on a Mountain Lion Mac that's been encrypted with File Vault 2. There we go. So we're going into terminal. Now, when you run the command, it's going to ask you for a password or a recovery key. But before we do that, uh, just to show you that there's nothing up my sleeves, I'm going to verify for everyone that, yes, uh, this Mac is actually encrypted. So running sudo FDE setup status. Hey, bonus, you're getting to see status. So yep, file vault is on. And it also says that I'm using the master keychain. Means I've got the institutional keychain somewhere on there. 
So I'm going to run sudo fd setup auth restart. Protections are reduced during authenticated restarts. Well, that sounds bad. OK, enter the password or recovery key. So what is actually happening is that when you put in the password, it is putting a unlock key in system memory, and it's rebooting. And when it reboots, the disk unlocks, and then the reboot process will automatically clear out that, uh, that unlock key from memory. So it's only in system memory for a very brief amount of time. So as you can see, we didn't stop at the preboot login screen. We went right to the regular login window. So what's this good for? Say you got a headless box that's encrypted with File Vault 2. You can use this to restart it and log in. Say you got something that you need to patch. You can run, you can run your patches, um, then run sudo fd setup auth restart. It'll automat, it'll restart your box. Your box will be patched and you'll be able to log in. I'm sure the people in the room can think of a whole host of uses for this thing, but basically it's a very nice way to make sure that uh, you're not locked out of the box. That if you're accessing something remotely, you can continue to work with it. Now, there are a number of File Vault 2 management solutions that use FD setup to manage File Vault 2 on Mount Mind Max, available from Jamf Software, Dell, if you can believe that, and open source projects. So this grid shows a listing of the management solutions that I personally have worked with. I'll have their strengths, so I recommend evaluating them carefully to find the one that meets your needs. Now, the ones listed, only Jamf Software opted to rely solely on FDE setup for its File Vault 2 management. So I'm going to be using Casper as my example management suite for the rest of the talk. So in Casper 8.6 and higher, there's a disk encryption configurations option available in the management settings. However, if you don't have the rights to manage a disk encryption, you don't see this setting. In order to access it and other disk encryption settings, some access rights need to be granted to your account on the Casper server. Now, it's important to know that these rights are not granted automatically to existing admin accounts. They will need to be enabled on a per-account basis. Now, if you haven't previously set up a disk encryption configuration, there won't be any existing setups found. Now, to get started on creating one, you would click on the Create Encryption Configuration button. Now, as mentioned previously, Jamf Software opted to rely solely on FDE setup for its File Vault 2 management. All Casper disk encryption configuration options use FDE setup's uh, capabilities. To illustrate, let's take some of the options available and translate them into their FDE setup equivalents. So, whenever you're looking at Casper and you're like, what does all this do? Those are the commands that it's running. The other thing that Casper handles is management of your recovery keys. Now, management of recovery keys is something that's really important with File Vault 2 encrypted Max, as they are your disaster recovery method. Disaster recovery is something you should always plan for when dealing with encrypted machines, because these are, all, after all, these are designed to protect your data against external threats unless properly authenticated. If your OS takes a dive, your normal way of unlocking may no longer work. Now, when a Mac has been encrypted using a Casper policy, Casper can provide back the recovery key if needed. Now, the three recovery key options available are the individual key, which is the alphanumeric key that File Vault 2 generates if there is not a File Vault master keychain on the Mac. There's the institutional key, which is a pre-configured File, uh, File Vault master keychain. And then there's the individual and the institutional key, which is FDE Setup's new way of using both the alphanumeric key and the institutional key together on one machine. Now, with this option, you can have two recovery key keys on the same machine. Now, the individual recovery key will be generated and sent up to the Casper server automatically without the admin needing to do anything. But if an institutional key is used, that institutional key will need to be generated and uploaded to the Casper server before you'll be able to use it. So let's take a look at uh, uploading an institutional key. So I'm going to log in as myself. And the first place we're going to go is into Terminal. <clears throat> yes, thank you. And once again, we're going to assume that there isn't a pre-existing File Vault Master Keychain that we're using. So let's go ahead and create one. So once again, we're running Security. Create File Vault Master Keychain. Okay. 
And we're going to store it in the library keychains. We call it file vault master keychain. Man, you type slow past me. All right. I guess he wants to get it right the first time. So, putting in our password for sudo. Putting in the uh, password that our institution has agreed upon to use as the master password. Retyping it, make sure everything's fine. Generating it, great. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, exit out of terminal. And our next stop is going to be keychain access. So here we have our unlocked file vault master keychain. There's our private key. There's our public key. At this point, we have both the keys needed for a complete recovery pair. So let's go ahead and export them out. And we're going to be exporting as a uh, P12 file. And this is, a, this is the format that you're going to use to upload it to the Casper server. Now, one thing that's very important about a P12 file, something you're going to see in a moment. And we're going to save that as a full recovery key dot P12. Okay. When you generate a P12 file, you are asked for a password. It is really, 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 really important that you do not forget this password. Because anytime you interact with this file, you know, aside from moving it around on your desktop maybe, you are going to be asked for this password. And if you forget it, that's it. So don't forget that password. It's very, very important. So that's a complete recovery key pair, but not everyone's comfortable about storing that up on their Casper server. So Casper has another option of using just the public key. Uh, because you, you only need the public key to actually encrypt a machine. You need both when you're doing the recovery, but to actually encrypt, you only need the public key. So we're going to go ahead and export out just that public key as a DR encoded certificate file. This is just like the procedure we used before. And save that out to the desktop. And next place we're going to go is into Safari to go up to our Casper server. But first, behold the lovely Janalia Farm internet. Is it not lovely and beautiful? Um, so, going to go to uh, our Casper server. Going to log in as my uh, Casper admin user. And in this case, I've, I've, I've previously given this account the ability to work with uh, disk encryption. So, going to go to management. There's our disk encryption configurations option. So we're going to click on that. As you can see, I've already set up a few uh, recovery keys previously. So let's go ahead and create a new one. I'm going to set that to be institutional. Give it a nice descriptive name. We'll call this one File Vault with Institutional Key. All right. Next thing we're going to do is upload. Let's go ahead and choose. Where did I put that? Uh, which one do I want? This time I want the P12 file. So I'm going to go up, select that. Click on Choose, hit Upload. And here I am prompted for the uh, password for that P12 file. Really, really important, you don't forget that password. I, I don't care what you do, don't lose it. Let's go ahead, hit Save. And there we go, Institutional Recovery Key is, list, is listed as a P12 file with a bunch of hex after it. Um, that's information from the certificate, it's not really important. You know, but the nice thing is you can tell that it's a complete recovery key pair by the fact it does have P12 at the front. So let's go ahead and create another uh, encryption configuration. Uh, but this time we're going to use just the public key. So we're going to call this file vault with institutional public key. Very important to label things clearly. And we're going to hit upload. And choose file. Go ahead and select that uh, certificate file, that CER file. 
upload it. And because this is the public key, public keys don't need protection, so there's no password, there's no nothing. Yeah, you can, if you wanted to, you could put that on a billboard if you so chose. So let's go ahead, hit save. And there we go. It's all set up, ready to go with our uh, new disk encryption configurations. So, it's up there. What do we do if we need it? Well, let's take a look at uh, downloading those institutional keys. Now, this is only going to be for that key 12 file because, of course, with the public key, that doesn't allow you to do recovery key. You don't care about, you know, downloading the public key for recovery. Well, you do, but you need both. So in this case, we're going to be focusing on getting that P12 file back out and setting it up for recovery. So we're going to log into our Casper server. Go into management, go into disk encryption configurations, and we're going to go back into a file vault with institutional key. And here, that's a link. We can actually click on that, and what it will do is it will download that P12 file. And Casper Server will name it recoverkey.p12, just to make it a little more un unambiguous what it is. So, now that we have the P12 file down, now we need to put it into a keychain to actually use it for recovery. So we're going to create a new uh, keychain. Um, this is going to be more of a one-time use throwaway recovery keychain. You don't need to hang on to this once you're done. But just for the sake of uh, consistency, I'm going to name this FileVaultMaster.Keychain and stick it out on my desktop. So, new password. This doesn't have to be your master password. This can be a password that only you know. Keep in mind, ideally, this is one-time use and then you pitch it. All right, so there's our File Vault Master Keychain. Great, unlocked, great. So next thing we want to do is just import item. We're going to go into Downloads. We're going to select CoverKey.p12. Destination Keychain is File Vault Master. Everything looks great. Boom, being asked for that P12 password. Anytime you mess with this thing, it asks you for the password. OK. Um, here, because we created our public key on a different machine, it's a self-signed SSL certificate. So since it's on a different machine, it's like, I don't know what this is. It's self-signed. So in this case, I'm going to select it to always trust. Because keep in mind, after I'm done with this, pew, trash it goes. So there we go. There's our public key. There's our private key. And at this point, we can use that uh, keychain um, for our institutional recovery key for you know the purpose that we need it for, and then we get rid of it. So let's go ahead and uh, do some cleanup. Let's get out of our Casper server. And let's go ahead and also go into downloads. <clears throat> downloads. All right, then take that recovery P12, but you don't want that hanging around, and secure empty trash. Just makes me feel a little better, secure empty trash. Some things are really, really gone. And that's it. There's our File Vault Master Keychain. It is ready for use as your institutional recovery key. Okay, so once a Mac has been encrypted using a disk encryption policy, authorized access, uh, authorized accounts will be able to access the recovery key from that Mac's inventory listing. Now, to access the recovery key, you would go into the inventory for that particular machine, you would go to storage, and then click on the lock icon next to the File Vault 2 recovery key listing. Now, once clicked, that icon disappears and reveals the recovery key information. Now, once again, you need to have the rights specified in order to even see that icon. So Casper allows quite a bit of role management. So, you know, this may not be something that you want your text to see. It may be something that only, like, you know, maybe you don't want your level 1 text seeing it. Maybe you don't want your level 2 text seeing it. Maybe you only want level 3 folks handling this. That's perfectly fine. Just don't assign your other text those rights. Uh, for those folks who have been assigned those rights, they will see that. They will be able to access it. Um, so in this case, the Mac in question is using both the individual recovery key and also an institutional recovery key. And clicking that download link will give you that P12 file that you need to build a complete recovery keychain. In that case, you do exactly what we just showed. Now, one way to encrypt your Macs is to do it with a self-service policy. 
In fact, if you want your users to handle it themselves, this is what I would recommend. And here's an example of how you may want to set one up. You want to give it a descriptive name and set it so that it's triggered by self-service. Execution frequency should be either set to once per computer or ongoing. And I've got mine set here to ongoing because I want to allow for decryption and then re-encryption later. Here I'm setting it to not reboot because I'm planning to do a deferred enable, which requires the user to log out and supply their password. Last but not least, I'm setting the disk encryption configuration I want to use, and I'm specifying that the Casper agent on the machine send an updated inventory back to the Casper server. In this case, I'm specifying that the recovery key type be the alphanumeric individual recovery key. In the chosen disk encryption configuration, since it's specifying that the current or next user will be enabled and that the individual recovery key is being used, the Casper agent will be running the FDE setup command shown up on the screen. So, let's take a look at how this appears from the user's end. So let's go ahead, go into self-service. As you can see, I don't do a lot with my Casper server, I just have the one policy. So let's go ahead and uh, click on the encrypt button. Short and sweet description, encrypt this Mac with FileVault 2. Let's go ahead and hit encrypt. And what's going on in the background is it is setting it up for a deferred enable, and it's also running an inventory and sending it up to the Casper server. It doesn't show that it's encrypted yet, no. So then the update inventory would be useful then? Well, it depends what you consider useful. I mean, it's always, for, depending on, I'm going to get to that question after I'm done. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, log out, uh, provide my password. And this is pretty, you know, this is pretty much a FD setup deferred enablement like uh, we saw earlier. And because my Artron account was the one that was logged in, um, FD setup chose and enabled that account. And there we go. Machines enabled. Uh, file Vault 2 encryption is running. Help desk call. Nowhere in sight. So, let's take that same policy and change the disk encryption configuration to have it specify that the Casper management account be used. Now, with the user change, the Casper agent will be running the FDE setup command shown on the screen. Now, I'll also be changing the displayed message so that it requests a restart instead of a logout. So, with the new user info, let's take a look at how this updated policy looks from the user's end. So, we're going back into self-service. Same button, same setup, same everything, but the behavior will be different. So, once again, we're doing, uh, in this case, we're not doing a deferred enablement. File Vault 2 is just setting up one specific account to uh, be turned on. It's a uh, the GM agent is supplying the account for that password in the background. And it's running an inventory and sending it up to the Casper server. Okay, so new message, reboot at the next opportunity. Okay, fine, hit okay. I'm going to quit out of self-service. And then we're going to restart. Now you can force that restart. Um, 
you may need to play a bit with the, you know, which command actually restarts it. Some folks have had luck with reboot. Um, oh, hang on. Casper manage, who's that? Because I don't normally use my Casper admin account as my actual admin account. I don't think I've ever logged into this account before. Nope, apparently not. So, Apple ID, I don't want to put that in. Let's hit skip. Skip. Yes, I'd like to start using my Mac. So, this would not necessarily, this wouldn't probably be something you'd hand off to your users because, of course, well, I don't know about you, I don't want to hand out my admin passwords to my users. So, this might be something more for IT where you can hand it off to, uh, junior tech and just say, I need you to encrypt this machine. Well, how do I do that? Well, you go into, uh, self-service, you hit this button, you wait a little bit, you restart when it asks you to, and then you put in the password. You know, it's a fairly, you know, it's a procedure that should be fairly easy for most folks to get. And if they can't get it, maybe you should move them somewhere else. Uh, but yeah, I mean, at this point, you're logged into your Casper management account. So a lot of folks I know use your Casper management account essentially as your main administrator account. So at this point, you'd be all set with your main administrator account to be set up. And if you're not using it as your main administrator account, at this point, you can go into system preferences or run FDE setup and enable your main administrator account. And also at that point, you know, enable your other users, whatever you need to do. So to wrap up, FDE setup is a Swiss army knife for managing File Vault 2 on 10.8. It can enable File Vault 2, it can add and remove users, it can report on File Vault 2 status, and much more. If you're managing File Vault 2 in your own environment, I really recommend using this tool. Properly used, it will save you time, and it will give you encryption options available with no other software. Now, if you want more information about FDE setup, I recommend checking out the July 2012 issue of MacTech. It's available now via the MacTech iPad app. If you go download the MacTech iPad app, uh, the July 2012 issues is one of the ones available. If you want print copies, if you go to MacTech.com, you should be available, uh, you should be able to order back copies from there. Or if you're a regular subscriber, go to that pile you have somewhere on your desk, dig it out, July 2012. Now, for more general information on File Vault 2, Apple has put out a white paper that describes best practices for deploying File Vault 2 on Lion. Now, because it is focused on Lion, it doesn't cover information on FDE setup, but it does cover a lot of interesting technical detail on how File Vault 2 works. Uh, some useful links for FDE setup and File Vault 2, including links to some topics that weren't discussed as part of today's talk. Uh, one in, exam in particular is uh, fourth one down, embedding certificate data into an FDE setup uh, plist file. I could not figure out how to make that work as a demo. Um, but basically what it is is you take that DER encoded certificate file and you can move it into uh, your input plist file. So if you want to set up everything with just one go, um, you can set up your accounts, you can set up uh, the institutional recovery key, it can all be contained within that plist file. And that link will tell you how to do it. Sadly, the FDE setup man page will maddeningly hint at how to do it. I had to figure that out on my own, and that link will actually tell you. Um, also, uh, Charles Edge did a great write-up on encrypting volumes uh, in Mountain Lion. I recommend you check that out. And uh, the best practices um, document for Fireball 2, link for that. And also, uh, if you're using the Casper suite, uh, Jamf Software has put out a great white paper for administering Fireball 2 on OS 10 Mountain Lion. They also have one for Lion, it is different, so if you want to use uh, it on Mountain Line, I recommend getting this white paper. And as mentioned earlier, here are the download links for this talk. It is available in a PDF format with the speaker's notes, and you can also download the keynote slides with all the speaker's notes and demos. So everything you just saw, if you click on the keynote link, everything will come down. The demos, the speaker's notes, everything. So I'm going to leave that up on the screen, and I am going to open the floor for q and I believe Luis had a question, um, so I'm going to follow back up with that one. Yeah, so the question at that point was, you were um, asking the policy to submit an inventory uh, on this, but at that point, because the user has not logged out, it does not show that it's encrypted, right, if you do submit inventory. So I'm not sure what the point of submitting inventory at that point was. 
Um, the point at that point is not actually directly related to file vault 2. It is more general housekeeping. Because you may just have, you know, who knows the last time this machine came in or checked in. At this point, at least you'll have, first of all, the uh, Casper server will know where is this machine. And also, it'll, at that point, with that knowledge, be able to scoop up the recovery key information right after the restart. So that's why I do that. Um, I have a couple other questions. The, without Casper Suites, the institutional recovery key deployment, um, when you created the keychain and you exported the certificate, you did that on the same machine that you were actually using to, um, to encrypt. Uh, but you could potentially just have that on your administrative machine and move that through your remote administration tools to deploy it, correct? Uh, so you're asking, so I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm suggesting how would one go about mass, uh, mass deployment of the... Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes. Uh, what you would do is basically all you really need to do is to mass deploy the institutional recovery key is make sure that your uh, file vault master keychain only has the public key inside of it. You'll want to save a copy somewhere else before you uh, take out the private key because you'll need both the public and private key for the recovery part. But uh, to prepare it for use, what you would do is take out the private key, lock the keychain back up, and then basically copy that keychain file to library keychains on the machines that you wanted to encrypt. That's how an institutional recovery key works. Um, and, and with that key present, all you have to do is run the FD setup and it'll find that keychain automatically and use it for its enrollment, if you will. Yes, though you do want to make sure to run the correct command because what will happen if, uh, say you run the FDE setup command, if you just run FDE setup enable and there's a key, there's a properly set up file vault master dot keychain in library keychains, it doesn't just pick it up and use it. Instead, uh, it'll say, I, I, I found a keychain and I shouldn't have and I'm now I'm going to complain and exit. Uh, so you have to tell it that there is a keychain on the machine and how you do that is with the keychain flag. So that's kind, that's kind of important. Um, similarly, if you tell it, uh, I want to use just the institutional recovery key and there actually isn't an institutional recovery key on the machine, FD setup will com complain to you about that as well. Yes? It's uh, our security policy, our choice, our policy, that all laptops are encrypted, all emails be encrypted before the user touch them. So we just have one user. And it's been our experience that as the user logs in, there are automatically added the list of users that can unlock the driver list. That's correct. That is. Um... That is the expected behavior. I've actually seen where there is currently a bug with AD users where they don't act automatically get added. But yeah, once the box is encrypted and a newly created, basically new accounts are added that didn't exist before the encryption was turned on, as they're added, they should be automatically enabled. Yeah. Yeah, or, um, yeah, basically, if you have pre-existing users, uh, or, you know, maybe you had taken a user out of the enabled list, but now you need to add it back. Things like that. It's, that, yeah. Yes? So, uh, Paul will be added a bunch of more enterprise friendly features that can be set to the system. Looking into the future, do you think that things like, uh, escrowing keys might become part of Telling the future when it comes to Apple is always a chancy, chancy proposition. I would like to see that. Um, I haven't seen that Apple is doing that. There are plenty of, I mean, this time last year when I was giving the talk, the only thing that was available was Cauliflower Vest. Mm -hmm. And now um, I've worked with three additional ones. I know of other ones that are out there. I've, I've heard, of, I think it was AirWatch that came out with a File Vault 2 key management system. I'm going, what? So, yeah, I mean, the choices are growing. It may be that Apple's just going to say, this is a third party opportunity. Apple already does key escrow for you if you are using the individual recovery key and you're, and you, and you send it up to them. Um, so they already have, at least on their end, the infrastructure to handle that. 
Whether or not they're going to build that into OS X server, I unfortunately just don't know. I have not been given any inside information. Shocker. <laughs> Luis? Yeah, I had a couple more questions. Uh, sorry about that. Um, the login window after encryption always seems to show the user icon, and I was not sure if there's an option to disable that so it still only shows uh, using password. You know what? That is probably my most common question, and unfortunately the answer right now is no. The account icons are it. And the way, basically the way Apple handles that is uh, it actually stores uh, the account icons as bitmaps in a little tiny unused corner of VFI. And then basically to display the account icons, it just goes in, grabs all the pictures it finds there, and displays them. So Apple has definitely heard about that from, from people. I have not heard if they're actually going to implement username and password blanks. But if nothing else, there has been multiple, multiple requests, both to myself and Apple. Um, and the other question I had was uh, around the deferral of uh, the encryption creation. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to defer to encrypt a specific user's account in the case where you know that you want only a specific user to have the encryption uh, or decryption capability? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Another person might log on temporarily. Oh, hang on. So uh, you're asking if you can defer. Defer the specific if if you can use defer and enable a specific user. So if someone else logs in, they don't get chosen. Yes, as a matter of fact, I believe I have that somewhere. What did I do with that? Yep. So what you would do in that case is uh, after you set up enable user username, tell it to defer and give it the plist. On their logout. Exactly. Yeah, you only get the wild carding if you don't put in that user username part. Yes. There, uh, you don't get recovery keys per user. You get recovery keys per machine. Or rather, let me let me rephrase that. You get recovery keys per encrypted core storage volume that was set up you know, on a, on a boot volume. So what that means is, is that File Vault 2 works on a per partition basis. So for example, if you had a machine with multiple partitions set up, each of which was bootable, you could set up FDE set up on each. You could run File Vault 2 encryption on each one and have a different recovery key. But it's, not, uh, it's really set up for that specific core storage volume. So you get, it's, it's different from uh, Legacy file vault where it did it per user, but even there you had one recovery key. Yes? Uh, yes. It affected my Active Directory users, and I have just about the most vanilla AD domain you can think of. I can only imagine that. You know, I, I can't imagine that having a more complex AD setup would cause this bug to go away. It would be nice. Uh, in that case, it would be like, oh, you have a very simple domain. You're affected with this bug. But this enormous Fortune 500 company, no problem. That would be, you know, well, wouldn't be nice for me, but it would be nice for the Fortune 500 company. Um, yeah, as far as I can tell, the complexity does not come into play. Your mileage may vary, but like I said, I have a very vanilla AD domain, and I see it. Any other questions? Uh, yes, Mr. Hester in the back. Your wish is granted. If you go to the Penn State Mac Admins 2012 resource page, there is, I gave another File Vault 2 presentation. I go into all of that in detail. Your wish is granted, sir. This, and it's up on YouTube. Yeah. I love granted wishes like that. Uh, I believe um, you had a, Jonathan? Same question. OK. Uh, yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, 
I think that's just for institutional. Uh, I, I think it'll just say, you know, file vault two is on. I don't, I don't recall. You know what? I can actually, one second. I'm looking at the clock. We have plenty of time. This is why I'm going, let's go to my website. <laughs> so, uh, ooh, hang on. Let me actually get that over where you guys can see. Ah, very big. One moment. So, for those not aware, I run a small website called uh, Dare Flounder. And, oh, crap. <laughs> Dang it. Eh. Wi-Fi bad. Ethernet, let me see if Ethernet works better. One moment. You get so used to stuff just working that you're like, yeah. Repeat. <laughs> it usually looks much better once. <laughs> but I'm going to take it. Oh, uh, okay. Yes, I agree. Get connected. <sighs> My firstborn. Uh, all right. Tell me this works. It's done. Yay, looking much better. Okay, so, and much bigger. Let me get that shrunk back down to size again. Ah, oh, shoot, come on. There we go. Not quite. Oh, I'm living with it. So for those who have not been to the site, I have quite a few posts on File Vault 2, including this extensive one on how to use FD setup, which includes way down here at the bottom what FD setup status looks like. So, let's see, do I have one for, it's just on. Ah, oh, man, no, don't I? Yes, there we go. This is what it looks like with the individual recovery key. It just says file vault is on. It's like screenshots, I love them. Uh, any other questions? Yes. In the case where you're using both individual and institutional recovery keys, mm -hmm. does it make any sense at all to try to individualize an institutional key permission? Hmm. That's going to be one of those things that's going to depend on how much overhead you want. Uh, I mean, in the case of the Casper suite, you can assign uh, individual disk encryption configurations to your to your policy. So if you wanted to, you could switch out which disk encryption key got used. That's a lot of overhead. Um, you the, the short answer is yes, you can. Is it practical? That's more in the eye of the beholder. I generally don't think so. Though there is one solution that actually will do institutional keys on an individual basis. Though in their case, they only use the institutional key. And that is uh, Credent Enterprise for Mac, which got bought by Dell. So they are now Dell Credent. Um, that's how Dell came to provide a File Vault 2 management solution. They do uh, institutional keys, and they generate a unique one for each machine. Now, they're doing it on an automated basis, and then they get, basically the keys get put up on uh, their incredibly, uh, you know what, I'm not going to say bad things about them. Um, they get put up on the management server, and uh, you can download them as needed. So this is really the only solution I've seen that really generates unique, individual, institutional keys for uh, File Vault 2 encrypted Macs. So if you want to go that route, Creedent may do it for you. You know, the other way, you can do it, but then you have to keep track of all those uh, institutional recovery keys. So... Yes, but not practical would be my uh, my comment. When, it, when you're managing them at that level, is there really any difference between individual versus institutional? Um, when you're managing at that level, I would probably say use the individual because it'll just, any t every time you encrypt the machine, it'll spit out a different individual recovery key. Uh, and at least from Casper's end, if you're using the individual key, you don't need to do extra work. You just say, I want to encrypt this machine, and then the Casper... Uh, server will just store that individual recovery key for you. You don't need to do uh, additional work. Now, if you were encrypting them manually, 
you know, like machines come in, you do it. I'd actually, I'd say use the institutional keys because it's less work for IT. It takes less time. The security risk is something you'll have to measure for yourself because it is a shared recovery key. You do have the same recovery key on multiple machines. Right. I guess uh, we're using EDP now. We're trying to get away from it and looking for something like a one-time recovery token. Right. This is, yeah, this is something that is, because the recovery keys are derived, and derived keys can be rotated, at least in the theory, it is possible to rotate them. I have not run into anyone who has rotated the recovery keys, and Apple has not provided the functionality. If you want that, file a future request at bugreport.apple.com, and send it to all your friends who also want that functionality so they can dupe the bug report. Yes, Tom. Uh, you mentioned in the, the common commands that might come up, FGE setup sync. Yes. Uh, and the man file is not particularly clear. No. Nope. What is syncing to OD? What, what is it syncing to OD? It's not actually syncing to OD. Right. It's pulling information from OD. And what it's syncing, what it's pulling down is whether or not the account is there, and also what does your account icon look like. It's, it's so. If you change, if you have your account icons managed from your OD server, if you change it on the OD server or your AD server, FD setup sync should bring down the updated, you know, picture down to your machine and have your lovely picture show up uh, at the file vault two preview login screen. The other thing it does is see is this account still there, and if the account is not there, it will take it out of the file vault two preview login screen. But it's, it's important that the account not be there at all. If you just disable it, sync is going to go, oh, still there. OK. Yes? That gets handled by, that actually gets handled by the operating system once you're up. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, going back to Der Flander, uh, where'd my mouse go? There we go. Okay, so here's basically how the process works. I have a handy video. So in this scenario, you changed your password on a password you know, change site, and your machine was off the network and didn't know about it. What will happen is, is that uh, when your machine comes back on the network and you go to start it up, the first time at the preboot login screen, you'll have to put in your old password. But then this happens. So I'm going to go ahead, select my AD account. So at this point, the OS is booting and contacting the directory service. And boom, you get stopped at the regular login screen. So here you essentially get to log in again. And this time, you're putting in your new password. And when you put in your new password, uh, the login window, the OS basically feeds back to File Vault 2 what the new password is. And this also gives you a chance to fix your keychain and everything else. Now, I have heard of a few instances, once again, to a uh, specific 2AD, where that update process does not work. However, I have not been able to reproduce that in my own environment. I don't know what kind of complexities they have set up. Um, but I can say from my own AD domain, this works. <coughs> yes. Mm. Right. Uh, this would be something that you'd want to. I'm going to first of all address one thing. Um, if your account is enabled, basically, if you can log in at the File Vault 2 preboot login screen, you can unlock or decrypt your Mac. Period. There is no stop. You know, there is no. Apple built a solution that keeps bad guys out. It was not designed to keep the good guys in. So, that has also been a feature request that's been sent over to Apple. I don't know what Apple is doing about it. Uh, however, the way that um, crypt 
and Cauliflower Vest and other solutions have handled this is that uh, when you log in at the, pr at, uh, so say your machine's decrypted and you go to log in, uh, the login hook will run a script that will detect whether or not you're encrypted. And if you are not encrypted, it pops up a login window that covers the login screen and forces you to basically re-encrypt your machine. And that's actually a very slick way of handling it because it's also a self-service process. You know, the user has to do it. And then right after uh, the encryption is enabled, your machine restarts. You're back at the, uh, the pre-boot login screen. You have to log in. So from your user's point of view, you know, decrypting your machine just means that at the next login, you get to re-encrypt your machine. Now, does Casper directly support something like that? Um, they don't have that kind of functionality, but you could set up something similar to that. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, like I said, they don't directly do, but you could set up something that does do it. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, the answer is no. But what you may be able to do is uh, there is a line in Etsy authorization um, that I, let me see if I have that. Do, do, do. Yeah, there we go. All right. So this actually showed up on the monkey list back in 2012, but there is uh, a line that you can remove. It's under System Login Console, Mechanisms, and it's this string. So I'm sure I just made that unreadable for a bunch of people. So, uh, but it's built in forward login privilege. And that basically is what tells, uh, the login screen, the login window to just allow you to go straight on into your account. Now, if you take that out, here's what happens. You log in at the file vault to preboot login screen, and then you automatically get stopped at the log, at the regular login window, just like for, uh, that password change thing. And at that point, you can use your smart card because the OS is up. So, is that acceptable to your security folks? I don't know. But it is a way to give that smart card login, even though it isn't available at the pre-boot login screen. OK, we're down to three minutes. I'm a big believer in letting people out just a little bit early. So any more questions? Last round of questions. Good job, Rich.